The following program was produced by an independent community producer. The opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the ECAT staff or board of directors. Giving a voice to the voiceless, pulling stories out of the shadows and putting them under the spotlight, making sure that each person is valued and cared for. This is Humanity First with Peter Evers, presented by BAMZ. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Humanity First. My name is Peter Evers. I'm the host of the show, uh, and I work at BAMZ, and BAMZ is a human service agency that uh, works with people, uh, vulnerable populations, and uh, folks who are struggling. And we're going to talk about the struggling economy today, which I think is a very uh, important topic you know, it is said that in election periods, people vote with their wallet. People vote with how they see the economy. Uh, the Clinton administration, of course, had that famous phrase, it's the economy, stupid. I think it still remains. Uh, one of the, when I was traveling through New Hampshire a few weeks ago, uh, there was a big board outside somebody's home saying something like, um, for those of you who voted for Biden, you owe me gas money. That is how local and how individually people feel about this. We're going to have on the show today Chuck Zoda, who is uh, uh, the host of Financial Exchange Radio and also with the Armstrong Advisory Group. And Chuck really is a, an expert about the economy and how the economy works. And we're going to talk about the levers that we can use in our economy to make sure that we can control inflation or deflation and that we can make sure that those less vulnerable in our, in our societies are uh, protected somewhat. Uh, and in my opinion, that's not the case. In my opinion, we need to do a lot more to help those people because we work with those people every day. But we're going to have a conversation about that. We'll see how that goes. We'll see what Chuck has to say. And uh, we'll be talking to somebody who really does know everything in and out about the economy. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm an essential worker here at BMZ, and I'm a nurse. Nurses are essential here at BMZ because as nurses, we really have the opportunity to make an impact. We have very small ratios, so we have the opportunity to really learn everything about the person served and be able to give the best care. It really serves such a great purpose for me as being a nurse and really why I came into nursing. Learn more about nursing opportunities at bmzjobs.org. Giving a voice to the voiceless, pulling stories out of the shadows and putting them under the spotlight, making sure that each person is valued and cared for. This is Humanity First with Peter Evers, presented by BAMZ. Welcome back, everybody, to Humanity First. And uh, today, as I've just said in the intro, we have uh, Chuck Zada with us. Um, Chuck is, as I said before, the host of the Financial Exchange, and he's with the uh, Armstrong Advisory Group. Great to have you with us, Chuck. Thanks so much for joining us. No, it's great to be here today. I really appreciate the uh, invite and getting to speak with you. Well, it's really good. And I know that you talk on a lot of radio shows, so we're very privileged to have you. Um, yeah, we, as I said before, we're going to talk about the economy. And as we think about uh, the services that we provide as a human service agency, um, there is much of the work that we do is um, really about social justice. And there is a great gap between the uh, the rich and the poor, and um, the economy is something that that people with not much income, and in, indeed the middle classes sometimes are very uh, susceptible to to those changes. Um, so, you know, as we look at the last couple of years and post COVID and and uh, the the interest rate issue and where we go with that, uh, and and of course. Uh, inflation that some people call out of control. I'm old enough to remember inflation that was uh, a, mo a lot more rabid in my uh, home country of England, um, but it is uh, had a real effect on people. And many of the people that we see, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis have been really uh, affected by that. Can we talk about what those short-term, <clears throat> um, what what are the short-term effects of this inflation um, and, and is it going to be long term? Is this something that we're going to be dealing with for a long time? Because people are talking about the pound, sorry, the pound in their pocket, the dollar in their pocket um, and, and how really they have a lot less, even though um, even our staff have had uh, pay raises trying to keep up with it. But it doesn't seem to be. Is this a short term or a long term thing that we're dealing with here? Well, I think the first thing that we have to be aware of is that even though we have a, a sense of what the drivers of inflation are, it's not physics. It's not something where there's, you know, empirical rules where if X happens, then Y immediately follows. 
you have to remember that economics is as much social science as it is a hard science. And so I think that when we look at the key drivers of inflation, we do know that it's a combination of a few different things. Uh, it can be excess demand or demand shock, so too much money coming into the system. It can be too little supply or supply shock, so not enough of you know what people want in the system. And then it's also inflation expectations. Do people believe that inflation is going to rise more quickly? And so when we look at the the combination of factors that led to high inflation, you know, with that peak in 2022, uh, ultimately we had all three of those things working against us because we had a setup where for the two years prior to that, you had a whole bunch of money that was pumped out into the economy to try to keep people afloat during the throes of the pandemic. So you had all this excess demand that was out there and people couldn't really spend a lot of it in 2020 or even in parts of 2021. And so it just kind of was, was lingering there. You then had these supply shocks that we've seen and they can be you know, on things that people were buying for their homes where you, know, you saw that no one could buy you know, grills and things like that back in 2021 because everyone had ordered them. Uh, it can be on things like commodities that were affected in 2022 after the Russian invasion of Ukraine where you saw all kinds of commodity prices being pushed up because of worldwide shortages. So you had supply and demand both working against us. And then that ended up being coupled with, hey, as prices rise, people expect prices to rise more in the future. And so those expectations were elevated as well. And so when we look at the picture today, it's a very different one that at least in the short term, and, and that's about as far as we can really project reliably on these kinds of things. The picture has improved on all three of those fronts. From a demand perspective, the big issue that we're facing now Wage growth is slowed, economic growth is slowed, and so you could actually make a case that demand might be getting close to a point where, you know, it's it's more of a concern of, hey, do we have enough demand in the economy rather than too much? On the supply side, while there still are some areas that have some supply chain disruptions, they're relatively minimal and it's it's not a huge impact at this point. Oil prices have come back down. Gas prices nationally are back around three thirty a gallon uh, at for for gas, and so I think you've seen that resolve itself, you know, for the most part. And inflation expectations, which are you know measured by a few different surveys that happen each month, those are basically back to where they were in 2018 and 2019 prior to the pandemic. And so, at least in the short term, it's really challenging to see the the return of any meaningful inflationary pressure. You know, kind of over the next six to 12 months, but obviously longer term, you know, there, there's always the potential for a new shock to come in and disrupt the system. And it's something that we have to always be aware of. Do you think the levers that um, that we have are too crude for uh, I mean, I always think it's like um, uh, sort of piloting a cruise ship and knowing that you have to turn left in 15 miles and having to turn to wait for it. Um, do you think, I mean, obviously this is tried and trust, trust, tr tested over many, many governments, but, you know, are those, are the measures that are available to us as a country um, sophisticated enough to, to sort of control that? Because, you know, a lot of, there are people that really suffer when interest rates are cut and there are people that really suffer when uh, inflation uh, rises. And those people tend to be those people who don't have very much. Do you do you feel as if there are things missing that we're not brave enough to take on, um, you know, in terms of fiscal policy uh, for a country? So I think that when we look at it, it's something where the, the tools that we use to combat inflation are largely interest rates at this point. We raise interest rates to try to slow the economy uh, in order to, you know, reduce inflationary pressures. And then once the economy does slow, we say, hey, now it's time to cut interest rates because we don't want the economy to go into recession. So they are kind of these blunt tools where, look, the, the Federal Reserve, who's the central bank of the United States, effectively acknowledges, look, we are trying to slow the economy to the point where inflation is no longer a problem, but we just don't want to go so far as to cause a recession. And we're not very good at not causing a recession. That's that's kind of the problem that we run into. So it is something where uh, on the fiscal side, you could look at it and say, yeah, there are more targeted and more you know, precise tools that we could use. But I also think that then it's a question of, okay, do we want to provide the government with the ability 
to use those tools when they want to and take them away when they want to, because ultimately you don't know who's going to have control of those levers of power. And if you grant a government those powers, it's unsure, you know, it's unclear exactly what they may decide to take away at their discretion. So I think it's a case where not just in the United States, but globally, governments have treaded kind of carefully with trying to use fiscal programs to manage inflation just because there are concerns about how that could be used when an opposing party or opposing, uh, you know, coalition were to come into power. Yeah, it's really interesting that you raise that point because sort of you you can have economic decisions and political decisions and and they often part company at various times you know i think about i think about an inflate uh, an immigration policy that that looked as if it might work quite well that got stymied because uh that was an entirely political decision thinking that an, a, a weapon against the other side was taken away by actually solving a problem that america needs to solve i would think the same thing uh works here there are probably other things that work a lot better that are politically just you know i, I think about um mortgage mortgage interest re, uh, relief right for instance is which is one of those things that could solve the national debt maybe but is just never going to work I, you know i think about increasing taxes um which sort of leads me into the next point uh, around interest hikes. Um, I was back in my home country a few months ago, and there's been massive political turmoil there, you know, in terms of a conservative party of 14 years that are thrown out eventually um, because they were in too long, not necessarily because the other party, the Labour Party, had really good answers. Uh, and yet, uh, when you look back on it, They've used interest rates a little bit like a mallet rather than a than a than a forcer and then than a knife. And then you get to this point where you look back and you say cuts in interest uh, raising interest rates doesn't hurt people who already own homes, who already have paid for their homes. It hurts people that are trying to get on the on the ladder who don't necessarily have much money. And yet the government says things like, well, the only thing we can do is enter a period of austerity here where people who are on assistance and, and low incomes and have SNAP and things like that, um, have that taken away from them. Um, are we not brave enough to do something different that doesn't end up hurting the poor and, 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 the, and the middle class, to be frank? So it's it's a tough argument. And it, here, here's why I, I struggle with it is the argument that you make is, is a good one today and that, hey, as interest rates have risen, it makes it really challenging for people to go and, and buy homes given where interest rates are today. But if we were to go back, you know, seven, eight years, I, I remember back in, you know, 2017, 2018, and again, I'm not saying that you were making this argument, but there were people at the time who were arguing, hey, low interest rates are hurting prospective home buyers because low interest rates push up the price of the home. And so that was something that we were hearing quite a bit then. And so it's it's challenging for me to hear that both low and high interest rates, depending on who you talk to, you know, hurt prospective home buyers. It can't be both of them because there's no perfect level of interest that we have out there. There's no you know right number that we're supposed to set it at. And ultimately, when it comes to housing, what I keep coming back to is the supply and demand side of the equation, which is look, if, if we really want to have cheaper housing, we need to vote in order to have cheaper housing. And when we look at how communities throughout the country end up voting, whether it's Massachusetts, Florida, California, Texas, Ohio, where, wherever it may be, when measures come up saying, hey, do we want to make it easier to build more and different kinds of housing in our local communities? We repeatedly say, no, we don't want that. And I think that ultimately is the bigger driver of why it's so hard to buy a house regardless of where interest rates are, is that we vote in such a manner where we say, no, locally, we don't want to make it easier to buy more housing because we like that our home values go up because we own them in our communities. We don't want more traffic. We don't want to have to see our property taxes go up to hire more teachers for more schools. And so I think that to me is the bigger and more consistent driver that I think we need to focus on. And if we did that, I think that the interest rate argument probably ends up going away because we'd actually have more housing available. Yeah, so no real uh, housing policy in the country because that housing policy is negated by essentially what our personal interests and self-interests that people have, which is really sad and actually was borne out recently, wasn't it? In some of these towns in and around Massachusetts sure. that gave up 
uh, state money uh, because they didn't want to build affordable housing near to railway stations. And so the stakes are that high when when those communities are saying we don't want money because we don't want to be um, subject to more people coming into our communities, which is which is sad, but very realistic, I think, when you when you begin to think about it. Um, Let's broaden out the, situ the 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 conversation here. Um, I was in upstate New York. Um, my son got married actually up, up there last week, um, and I was struck uh, driving through Massachusetts. You know, you, you leave the the sort of blue zone of of Boston and and around, and you start driving through Townsend and and um, and Belchertown, places like that. You get into upstate New York, and many of these villages, um, I think you may have heard the term zombie towns, these towns that are dying, um, and these towns where you see um, that there are um, houses that are literally falling into the ground. Um, and there is, or there seems to be very little infrastructure in, in places in America. America seems to be turning into to a, a land of two uh, types that you know the wealthy cities and and the rural poor we don't pay a lot of attention to to those um well how's that going to end up chuck how how are we going to solve that disparity of income um without creating two countries you know it's it's a huge challenge because the the issue that you reference there it's one where many of the the younger people in those communities often end up once they graduate high school or college, they might leave and not come back to those communities simply because the jobs are not available for them there. And I, I think ultimately it's gonna be one of the big challenges that we face because those are aging populations and aging communities that you have there that often require you know, higher levels of services as they, they age in those communities. And they simply don't have the tax base or the, the people there even to provide those services in a number of cases. I, I know a number of people that live uh, in some pretty rural communities in, in northern Maine. And, you know, what you've seen there are cases where, look, the, the only grocery store in 50 miles closes or the only gas station in 20 miles closes and you have to go, you know, a farther distance just to, to be able to provide basic essentials for your family. And that even speeds up that exodus from those areas. And, Quite honestly, I, I don't know that there's a good or easy answer because, you know, with with America, one of the things that we've seen, I mean, again, we're a relatively young nation, but you've still seen a lot of these communities that have been in flux over time. And, you know, I, I, I go to Maine quite a bit. And the thing that always fascinates me there is you'll be walking through the woods and you think it's, you know, complete woods. And all of a sudden you see a stone wall there in the middle of the woods and you're sitting there and you go, what, what's what's going on here? And you have to realize that, look, 150 years ago, most of Maine was farming before the railroads made it easier and cheaper to you know, bring the stuff in from the Midwest. Yeah. And, and so a lot of these communities might have already seen a rise and fall over multiple generations before, and we just don't realize it. So it's it's part of, I think, just what we've seen in America because of its size and its, its vastness. You have seen this happen before. And I don't think we have any good idea about how to prevent it or to, to even deal with the fallout on a daily basis, because, you know, when we talk about how this happened 150 years ago, it sounds very far away. But when you talk about it happening to a family now that they're living through, it, it's a much bigger problem. And I, I wish we had better answers to it. But uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have any good answers as to how we deal with this other than to say we've been through this cycle before and we didn't deal with it well at those times. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting because there was a wonderful article in the New York Times this weekend about loneliness and isolation. And these two things are very connected, aren't they? You know, um, I used to live up in New Hampshire and and it turned out and this this um, article talked about this. People between the ages of 25 and 35 are feeling very isolated in New Hampshire and in Massachusetts as well. Um, and it was a very depressing article about people not feeling as if they can share um, feelings with other people uh, that they're valued. But the end of the article was, was, made me think there is hope because loneliness and isolation happens, you know, when uh, in every generation in, or, or over time, you know, you think about the invention of the motor car, right, as they used to call it. Um, <clears throat> people worried that that would disperse people all over the all over America, all over Britain, wherever, wherever it is. 
And it did. And yet we then had the telephone, which came along. Again, people won't talk to each other uh, face to face, but they can connect between Boston and, 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 and L.A., for instance. Um, maybe we just are in the middle of one of those undulating moments in history where there is a flooding to the cities like they did in the Industrial Revolution um, and agriculture will 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 decline until we realize that we can't feed ourselves anymore and incentives will come along, which will revitalize the farming community, which I think is happening a little bit with younger people getting into farming. So I think I think you I think you're right. There is an optimism there in terms of this is how a democracy and a young country grows. Uh, and if you see it in those terms, there is short term pain, but there's long term hope for recovery uh, and and growth uh, in in communities. And you know, and then you have these ideas about you know high speed rail travel and and improving travel uh, and and those kind of things which uh, I think are the things that will come along and help that. But, you know, I think we're in the middle of a bit of a downturn at the moment in terms of in terms of our economy. And unfortunately, the people who need it most are getting the least help. Uh, Chuck, we have run out of time. So I really appreciate you coming on the show. And, and uh, as I always say, I, I hope you'll come back because what you've had to say is really important to the people that listen to the show and the people that we serve. Absolutely. I, again, I really appreciate the uh, invite and getting to spend some time with you today. And if you ever do want to have me back, just reach out and I'm happy to uh, to join you again. This was great. Thank you so much, Chuck. Really ap appreciate it. Chuck Zoda there, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>